Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. This will be a very interesting panel today entitled The Power of Protest in Eastern Europe, Russia, Poland, and Belarus. We're very fortunate today to have this event, which is sponsored by the Keck Center for International and Strategic Studies at Claremont McKenna College, as well as the EU Center of Southern California located at Scripps College. So we both welcome you and we're so thrilled that you could join us with this panel of true experts on what is happening in terms of the protest movements, uh, movements in the countries that they'll be speaking about today. So we have three speakers on our panel. Uh, the first speaker is Dr. Regina Smith, and she is a political science professor at Indiana University, and she studies the evolution of state society relations and state responsiveness in autocratic regimes um, and transitional regimes. And we're so thrilled that she could speak to us on this topic because she has a book that was just published at Cambridge University Press um, entitled Elections, Protest and Autocratic Regime Stability, Russia 2008 to 2020. So hot off the press is very exciting. The next speaker I'll introduce in turn, and that will be on Poland by Dr. Uh, David Ost followed by Dr. Yulia Brell speaking on Belarus. So with no further ado, I'm going to ask Dr. Smith if she would uh, begin her presentation on the protests in Russia. Please, for all of those who are joining us in the audience, uh, I'd love to ask you if you have questions along the way, please post them in the Q&A function uh, at the bottom of your screen um, you don't have to wait until the end. If questions pop into your head, please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A. And once all three speakers are done with their presentations, we will turn to questions. So looking very much uh, forward to hearing your thoughts about their presentations. So Dr. Smith, I hand the floor over to you. Thank you um, for inviting me today to having me on this amazing panel and giving me a chance to talk about this work I've been doing. What I've, how I've organized the talk today is in terms of five big myths about Russian protest. And in part, it goes right to uh, the topic you put in your introduction. So until very recently, if we talked about a social movement in Russia, most of my Russian colleagues would say it's not a movement. It's simply a very disparate group of events or uh, a disjointed set of actions that haven't coalesced into a movement. And I think what we are observing in Russia now is the coalition of a movement across a whole bunch of different types of protest coming together around uh, support for systemic reform um, from a lot of different camps. And that's what I, I, I'd like to get across here. So I wanna talk about the five myths of Russian protest. The first myth that I think it's really common that we hear all the time that Russians are passive. And in fact, if you look at what's been happening in Russia over fit, the last 15 years, but particularly since 2011, 2012, is a growing uh, capacity for civil society to self-organize, to move from the bottom up and uh, to address discontent, shared discontent and engage in collective action. And there are two types of actions that are happening in Russia today. The first, the Russians themselves call non-political protest. And I wanna, I wanna start by underscoring that this is in fact political, that they're looking for uh, changes in government or changing in redistribution or change in policy, but they're not looking for revolution or regime change. So it's disconnected from the broad broader questions of governance. And these types of events happen as on the left here, a recent strike among dock workers in the Far East, which ended in these dock workers taking off their construction helmets and pelting the owners of the enterprise with them in uh, protest for uh, bad working conditions. The next uh, picture shows a, a response, a spontaneous response to a tragic fire in Kemrova, where 41 children were killed and, and many adults, uh, 63 altogether, I believe, were killed and people came to the square to demand uh, the, that the governor resign and in fact were successful in securing that. There was a nationwide set of protests against tra toxic trash incineration. The regime's solution to this problem was to uh, 
build a waste dump in the, in the far north in Arkhangelsk in Russia. And that led to even bigger protest in Arkhangelsk about exporting the problem of Russian cities into uh, the far north. And then finally, very common historic preservation or park preservation protests that occur all over Moscow. This one over the in Ekaterinburg over the reconstruction of a cathedral. And these folks are engaging in all sorts of repertoire, right? So across these actions, you see these really amazing uh, types of expression of discontent in Arkhangelsk, a camp that rivaled Occupy Wall Street with a Russian tinge of having a banya tent, right? That went on for quite some time. There are people who are constructing artistic uh, protests like Pussy Riot or the toy protests where expressions are made through toys and then posted on social media. The truckers uh, protest by blocking traffic or creating a snail, slowing down traffic. And uh, when, an, when uh, a journalist, a successful journalist, opposition journalist was arrested uh, and framed for holding drugs, even regimes related uh, newspapers down here on the right posted the same front page uh, expressing their disapproval uh, I, we all are Ivan Golunov. And so what you have is this different way of communicating discontent from the regime and, and normalizing discontent in all sorts of different ways. And in all of these cases, uh, protesters won, not all done in the case of Pussy Riot, but many of these cases, protesters win concessions from the regime. The second myth uh, regards the type of protests we most often read about in the New York Times or Washington Post. And these are political protests directed explicitly uh, against uh, the abrogation of rights, fraudulent elections, or calling for Putin to go. While we often put these in the basket of the kinds of protests that we saw in Ukraine or Georgia earlier, the colored revolutions, these are explicitly reform protests. So when the slogan is Putin uhadi, or Putin must go, the idea here is that we want the chance to vote him out. Now, that's not everybody. There are, of course, increasingly radical elements of this protest, but by and large, people who come out are demanding reform and the operation of um, rules as written rather than a, a sort of revolutionary upheaval. As I've already indicated, whether political or non-political, these protests are growing across Russia. So often we talk about Russian protest only in terms of Moscow. That would be a misnomer. The, by far the most uh, non-political protests happen outside of Moscow. But even now we see increasingly political protests such as in the Russian Far East. Uh, which called for the return of a popular governor. And then on the right, uh, post-election protests in uh, Russian Siberia uh, asking for a recount or just simply to publicize fraud. So we're seeing this growing protest swell uh, in parts of Russia that are often thought of as conservative. The, the fourth myth is that protest is declining. And I think this goes hand in hand with the idea that these uh, opposition activists are somehow one and done. These guys are playing a long game. So there has been a progression of protest from uh, the major post-election protests in 2011, 2012, to the anti-corruption protests of 2017, and then the most recent protests in uh, Moscow in support of Navalny. So here, I think the idea is we often look at a large-scale protest event or a point in a protest cycle and say, it has failed. And in fact, each one of these events is changing both individual propensities to, to participate in the future. It's changing how the opposition can organize its resources and capacity, and it's changing how the regime is responding. And so that it's really important to look at accumulation of change over time and not respond 
to any single event. And here you see some of the changes that we're starting to observe. Younger people who stayed away, look at 2011-12, looks like all of the people like me, and then the post-election protest or the uh, anti-corruption protests in 2017 was a much younger crowd. Women are protesting more. First time protesters were the by far the biggest constituency in the Navalny, the recent Navalny protests. So we're seeing a change in what's happening in Russia. Finally, I think uh, there is a myth that elections in Russia are irrelevant. And they're not if you look at them as an interaction between elections and protest. And this has been Navalny's great challenge to the Russian regime, is that he linked elections to protest events. And not only the outcome, the fraudulent nature of elections, but also the electoral process. So participating in elections is now a way to protest or contest. And let me just clarify very uh, quickly here. For instance, the regime basically coerced people into protesting, uh, into participating in the constitutional national vote to adopt the new constitution. And many people did. Uh, and as a result, their expectations changed. And so for example, uh, pensions were promised, indexing pensions was promised in this constitutional reform. And when President Putin tried to renege on that promise earlier this week, he was forced into backtracking and indexing those pensions. So that these elections are changing people's expectations when they are forced to participate and they want the quid pro quo they are promised by participating. We see Navalny's smart vote effort where he is pointing out to people, candidates who can uh, engage in policy change or policy contestation and texting them names of people to vote for so they can, voters can coordinate around these folks. And voters did coordinate around these folks and it changed the outcome of some elections. So recent work by Russian scholars, uh, Mikhail Turchenko and Grigory Golosov shows the effect of smart vote uh, in places across Russia. They don't always win, but they create a greater challenge and a barrier. Finally, in a case I've been working on lately, the case of Moscow housing, which involves a lot of contentious politics, it led to a lot of young people wanting to run for office and the formation of new election schools to show young people how to overcome the, ba the barriers of getting on the ballot and to link contentious politics with formal politics through this election mechanism. And this also is a model that can be spread across Russia. So yes, we see now that this is working. Navalny, I don't know if you saw the news today, Navalny was sent to uh, a labor camp, an undisclosed labor camp today. Um, there, the rise in violence of the regime uh, is an indicator of, of what is happening in Russia. And so the regime is having to adapt riskier and riskier strategies. And I'll end on this note. A new poll out by the Levada Center says that uh, the people who want Russia, uh, Putin to leave is now 48% of the population. And among young people, that percentage goes well over 50%. And so this is why we're seeing the regime increasingly take risks and the challenge of protests becoming greater and greater. So I think there are lots of parallels to other cases here and I'm just thrilled to be able to uh, talk about this a little more. All right, thank you so much, Professor Smith. Um, our next speaker will be talking about protests in Poland. So Professor David Ose, he's a member right now of the Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton University. And he normally teaches at Hobart and William Smith Colleges in upstate New York. Um, he's written a lot on Eastern Europe, especially Poland, um, focusing on labor, class, democracy, um, and his books include Solidarity and the Politics of Anti-Politics. Uh, workers after worker states um, and the defeat of solidarity, anger and politics in post-communist Europe, as well as uh, a special issue, many, many articles. And we're just so fortunate today to hear him give us some insight into the protests in Poland. So, 
Professor Ost, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hillary, for the invitation and uh, thanks to my co-panelists and greetings to everyone. So um, I, I suspect many of you have heard that uh, Poland has taken a right wing turn. They've gone very politically to the right since a new government, not new anymore, uh, uh, took power in 2015. But a little less known than the uh, political turn has been the cultural turn, the cultural changes. Basically, the program of the political right seems to be to kind of engineer a vast cultural counter-revolution, right? One could say, if, we were, if it was just in the West, we would say against the 60s. There, they would say against the, the, the cultural changes of 1989 and of the communist period as well. Basically, it's a turn very much against progressive ideas, against liberal and progressive culture, and attempt even, and so, sometimes they talk about to re-sanctify Europe. Now, you know, some of this might, might sound vast, ambitious, megalomaniac in some sense, uh, but it's important to understand that not everyone, but many people in the ruling party are very consistent about this and really see it as a long-term long -term campaign. Just as Regina said about a long-term campaign of the uh, opposition, one could see on the part of the political right this long-term campaign to change things culturally. Much of it has its roots in um, 1978. What happened in 1978? Well, the first time in 450 years that the Catholic Church chose a non-Italian Pope, right? This was Pope John Paul II. And uh, John Paul II sometimes talked like that, right? About this grand change in Europe and these big cultural transformations that are necessary, you know, and, and again, that, that uh, we've been caught behind, but now we have to catch up very quickly. And an attack on women's rights, on reproductive rights, has played, has, has been a central part of this, right? It seems to be the sense like cut the idea of personal individual rights for women, right? That we control our bodies and we control our uh, uh, reproductive timelines, right? If uh, when women can be removed of these kinds of uh, wills and desires, we can restore this kind of traditional culture and uh, uh, all this progressivism. It's one aspect of you know, tearing down the progressive culture uh, and, and replacing it with this idea of traditionalism, conformity uh, underpinned by a very strong Catholic church. Now, Poland has, of course, been often, uh, has been very Catholic for a long time. Of course, there were many non-Catholics in Poland in the interwar period as well. Um, uh, uh, ended tragically with the war and the Holocaust. And Poland, since the 1945, has been largely a Catholic country. But when I was in Poland in the 1970s, early 1980s, abortion was pretty available, was available on demand, and it was not an issue at all. Really, no one was talking about that. In any case, right, things have changed. Uh, the Law and Justice Party, headed by uh, Yaroslav Kaczynski, uh, organized in the late 1990s, and uh, in 2013, it was not yet in power, but in 2013, both the Law and Justice Party and the Catholic Church started for the first time coming up with this campaign. They said, we're against gender ideology. We're opposing gender, gender ideology. People tried to explain that gender ideology, gender is just a term, you know, a, a, a cultural, a, about cultural roles that uh, sex as a cultural concept, not a, not a biological one but they were having no part of it. They said gender ideology is the enemy. It's the thing that is allowing all these changes, all this progressive culture. We have to fight gender ideology. No one knew exactly what it meant, but in 2015, the Law and Justice Party then won an election and came to power. Now it didn't initially begin with that cultural uh, transformation. It began with a 
a couple of other measures. At first, its first set out to do was to subordinate the constitutional court. That is, they knew they were going to be doing things that ran against the constitution, so they needed to have a non-independent court that would legitimate what it did. So it uh, went through a whole number of measures, illegal measures, uh, ne nevertheless, it forced through and subordinated the court to itself. That brought out a lot of protests already, first massive protests in 2015-16, and government, um, uh, well, these, these protests brought a, a lot of people, often hundreds of thousands altogether in Poland, and, uh, but they were mostly populated the protest by people a little older in their 40s and older, very politically minded. At the same time, the government did some popular economic policies uh, to deter some of the protest, a cash payment for parents of children up to age, age 18. So it, it, it pursued some of these programs. So the first couple of years, there was a lot of opposition, but strong support as well. Um, and uh, in, after that, then it's begun since 2017, and even more since winning re-election in 2019, begun pushing for this cultural transformation that I was talking about. In 2017, it first proposed to ban virtually all abortion. Now, it should be noted that in 1990 already, Poland implemented one of the very most restrictive abortion laws in Europe very limited amounts of uh, legal, legal abortion. Uh, so it, there was a total of about 1,500 perhaps a year legally. This is in a country of nearly 40 million people. So there was an underground abortion uh, milieu, but, uh, but uh, it's still very, very restrictive. When they put forth that program to ban all abortion, it brought out massive protests uh, by younger people, by women all across the country, including even in small towns. And they backed off on it then. But when they won re-election in 2019, now they don't have any more ec populist economic benefits to provide to people. So it's been all in the last couple of years about cultural counter-revolution, cultural reaction. So in October 2019, they arranged so that the constitutional court now under their control would uh, take up the abortion law that was already very restrictive. And in October 2019, it, uh, it announced that all abortion with the exception of uh, uh, about 5% of the previous legal abortions would be illegal. This is what brought out massive protests right away. And um, I'm just going to play in the background here. The, you see uh, uh, pictures. This is of this huge demonstration in October 19, uh, 2020. Uh, and and uh, hundreds of thousands of people. This is only Warsaw alone. There were also massive protests uh, in small towns everywhere. This is by far the largest demonstration uh, and that that post post communist Poland has has seen. Um, again, these are pictures of Warsaw. It doesn't show what's happening elsewhere. But perhaps more impressive was what was happening elsewhere in these small towns, almost every town in Poland uh, with large demonstrations uh, and very critical of the church and and critical of the government and very much of the church. And what's so important about this is a massive generational challenge as well, right? A powerful opposition to the church for interfering in our lives, right? Which is the church has uh, control of education, uh, well, has obli partly obligatory education in schools, uh, in small towns outside of, um, outside of, uh, uh, Warsaw, the, it's virtually obligatory. And one of the things that were happening in these protests was not just that people would go out and demonstrate, but they were very confrontational. They were very impolite. 
Now it might sound, might sound, it might sound banal, but in a culture, right, where you've always taken, um, there, there's a, a kind of, well, you're nice to the priest, right? That's a long-term cultural familiarity, a cultural pattern. And this was shattered in ways that really shook up the mainstream, shook up the conservatives. There were some remarkable pictures of high school, young high school women, girls, right? Yelling, yelling at priests, going back, just go back, leave us alone. The big slogans of these protests have been uh, F off with the difference that they didn't say F off, but they said the word in full and had their posters saying that. And they would demonstrate that, right? That this is not a time we're not going to be polite anymore. Uh, and there was a women's strike at times and it's re re resurfaced protests. In January, 2021, uh, the court's decision was officially published and it brought out another big wave of protests. Now, what's the impact here? Well, on the, you could say very little and very much. Very little because the law is now the law. Virtually all abortions are banned in Poland. Uh, and that's the legal status of it. Several women who uh, their fetuses are completely unviable will die immediately upon birth. We're in the process of getting a legal abortion. They have to either give birth or go elsewhere to seek a, uh, an abortion. So the government uh, was unflexible. It allowed the demonstrations, but nothing has changed in that way. On the other hand, very much has changed culturally. This activism of the young women, and uh, not just women, but really of the youth in general. These massive demonstrations, unlike the previous ones, were populated particularly by, by groups age 15 to 25. Plenty of older population as well, but well over half would be in that young age group. And uh, as I say, very critical of the church. So what are some of the things that have happened? There have been more so-called apostasies, meaning official withdrawal, official quitting of the Catholic Church than there's ever been in all these years. At these demonstrations, women held up signs that said, if you want an abortion, contact us. We will get you the abortion that you need either via underground or via, uh, will help you go to a neighboring country where you can get it legally, right? So there's been this huge kind of um, activism there that has led for uh, uh, these kinds of massive changes. So again, politically, it's still very much at a standstill. Well, not a standstill, the government's position uh, has won and it is the most restrictive abortion law in the European Union right now. Uh, and uh, it doesn't look like it's going to change, but it's mobilized so many people that even the main, the liberal middle of the road opposition party, which had never gone on record supporting abortion rights in the past, has now in the last week decided that, in, uh, that it will. Not as far as many of the activists want, but that's brought about a sea change. So culturally, Poland is really enmeshed in this kind of struggle right now, and we'll see how it unfolds in the months and years ahead. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Uh, fascinating, I appreciate that. We'll move on to our third speaker, Dr. Yulia Brell, who's an assistant policy scientist at the Center for Applied Demography and Survey Research at the University of Delaware, where she also holds a PhD from uh, University of Delaware in Urban Affairs and Public Policy from the Biden School of Public uh, Policy and Administration, um, as well as a master's degree in linguistics from uh, Minsk State uh, University in Belarus. Um, Dr. Brell has done her research focusing on the problems of transition from authoritarianism to democracy in Central and Eastern Europe. And she will be speaking to us today about the protests in uh, Belarus against the um, electoral fraud. So please, Dr. Brell. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Let me share my screen with you. 
Belarus is a small landlocked country located right here between Poland and Russia, between Ukraine, Lithuania, and Latvia. And uh, from the 9th century until 1991, Belarus has always been part of some other larger polities, from Kievan Rus to the Russian Empire to uh, the Soviet Union. For a very brief period of 10 months in 1918, the Belarusian People's Republic was proclaimed. However, very quickly it was seized by the Bolsheviks and turned into the Belarusian, Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republic, or BSSR, that later became part of the Soviet Union. Um, in July 1991, the Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republic declared its sovereignty from the Soviet state. One month later, in the same year in August, uh, the country was named the Republic of Belarus. And in 1994, uh, in July, Alexander Lukashenko became Belarus' first and so far only president. Um, so let me talk briefly about presidential elections in Belarus. So in 1994, when Belarus had its first presidential election, which was the only really democratic election in Belarus, there were two rounds. Uh, and that was also the only time when Belarusian uh, presidential election had two rounds. So Lukashenko won the first round with uh, almost 46%, and then the second round with over 80%. Um, in 2001, there was the second presidential election where Lukashenko won again with over 77%. And this time that election was followed by some protests. Five years later in 2006, six, Lukashenko won again with 84, over 84%. And this is when he called his victory an elegant victory. Um, uh, that election was also followed by some protests and what was called the Jeans Revolution when students were protesting. But those protests were very soon crushed by the right police. So the election was on March the 19th and the right police already dispersed the protest by March 25th. Uh, four years later in 2010, Lukashenko won again with almost 80%. Uh, that time, uh, almost 40,000 people were already out in the streets in Minsk alone, which is the capital of Belarus protesting against rigged elections. They were beaten by the riot police, many of them arrested, but again, the protests were very quickly dispersed. Five years later, October 2015, the fifth presidential election, Lukashenko won again. This time, 84% voted for him, allegedly. However, this time, no mass protests and no arrests were, happened in Belarus, uh, presumably because people were very scared by the events in the neighboring Ukraine in 2014, and we're very much afraid that this scenario could be repeated in Belarus. However, in 2020, on August the 9th, when uh, Belarusians were electing their president for the sixth time, the situation turned out to be completely different. So the same day when the Belarusian state um, TV channels projected Lukashenko's landslide victory again, and then later announced that he won with 80% and his main rival Svetlana Tikhanovskaya allegedly just got over 10%. So the Belarusian society this time just erupted. Uh, the situation after the election of 2020 differed significantly from everything Belarus um, had seen before. First of all, it differed in the unprecedented scale and duration of the protests that followed the election. It's already February and the protests are still going on. They're not, of course, so populous as they were in August or September, but people are still protesting. So it's been almost six months. Um, uh, that election also, uh, the crisis also differed from whatever we experienced before in unprecedented cruelty and downright statism of the riot police. Uh, also, the difference was that this time it wasn't just the traditional opposition of students protesting against the rigged elections, it was uh, people from all walks of life. And it was clear that the majority of Belarusians this time were against Lukashenko. And of course, Lukashenko was not going to give in without what someone called a bloody fight. And to confirm this, I'm going to quote Lukashenko saying uh, this uh, several days after the election. We held an election, there won't be any other election until you kill me. And he meant what he was saying at that point. So what are the reasons for the current conflict or the conflict that occurred between the regime and society in August and after that? Until 2015, Lukashenko's political longevity was partially accounted for by the social contract 
he and Belarusian society had tacitly concluded, and the contract was loyalty in exchange for well-being. Until 2015, Lukashenko uh, was able to honor his part of the contract, and people's well-being was steadily improving and uh, increasing. However, by 2015 already, Belarus was experiencing yet another economic crisis, and Lukashenko couldn't promise uh, any more um, that he would uh, contribute to the improvement in the well-being of people. But uh, the crisis in Ukraine came as a blessing in disguise for Lukashenko. People were very much afraid of what was going on there. And they agreed to exchange their loyalty this time for peace, because Lukashenko promised that there will be peace in Belarus and that economy was not that important anymore. However, by the summer of 2020, Lukashenko had nothing else to offer society. And it was clear that the electorate was restive and perhaps change was in the air. So there were several reasons that led to the current uh, conflict. First was the dividend economic crisis uh, as a result of the so-called tax maneuver when Russia began to cut export duties on its crude oil and simultaneously increase the mineral extraction tax and the prices of Russian oil for Belarus began to grow. So ultimately Belarus will have to pay uh, world prices for uh, crude oil and will not be able to buy cheap oil from Russia, then refine it at its refineries and then sell it at market prices in Europe anymore. Another reason for uh, this crisis was uh, um, the so-called Medvedev's ultimatum. So Belarus and Russia concluded a treaty in 1999 and created a union state of Russia and Belarus. And until approximately 2015, that union state existed mostly on paper. But since uh, 2015, Russia has been insisting that Belarus agreed to a much deeper political, military, and economic integration. Uh, for example, it was demanding the establishment of supranational bodies and the introduction of a single currency in the Union state. Uh, it also wanted uh, to create, um, to unify the systems in such areas as taxes, customs, and energy. But if Belarus agreed to these concessions or agreed to make these concessions, then it would most probably lose its sovereignty and even independence. And this was not something that Lukashenko would ever agree to because it also was a threat to his personal power. Another reason for the conflict, for the current conflict was the complete passivity and indifference of Lukashenko during the COVID-19 pandemic. Belarus is the only country that never introduced any lockdown, any quarantine. And as far as I know, if I'm not mistaken, masks uh, began to be required in public places only in November of 2020. Before that, there was not even that requirement. Another reason was the crackdown on alternative candidates before the election, uh, uh, such as Sergei Tikhanovsky, Viktor Babarika, and Valeria Tsipkala. Uh, then it was followed by harassment and mass, mass arrests of independent observers at the polling stations. And as I have already mentioned, the unprecedented cruelty of repressions during the first few days after the elections. So these were all the uh, all major reasons that led to the conflict between society and the regime after the election of 2020. Now the question is why this protest this time persisted for so long. There are also several reasons for that. For that. Well, the electoral fraud uh, played uh, the role of a catalyst for the onset of mass, mass protests. Um, many people in Belarus believe that all elections, but the first one have always been rigged in Belarus. But before society in general somehow accepted the outcomes uh, with very little or none resentment whatsoever. But this time the lie was so egregious that people just could not stand it anymore. Then the sadistic police beating and torture of not only peaceful protesters, but also bystanders. So many people who were not even participated in the protest ended up in jail and were tortured and some people were killed. Um, Another reason that helps uh, protests to persist uh, was the informal social networks and social media, which were used as means for sustaining protest activity. Uh, also, this protest committed to nonviolent action, which also helped. And another important thing was that this time uh, the protest mobilized people um, not only in the capital, but also in smaller towns and cities and even villages in Belarus. And then they managed to mobilize, again, not just the traditional opposition, but also intellectuals, white collar workers, professionals. And what is what was probably the most surprising part was the, that they mobilized the working class. So people who worked at state owned enterprises and who traditionally would support Lukashenko uh, at presidential elections. 
So uh, these projects, they had several important um, impacts. One of them was that in November 2020, the US Congress reauthorized uh, Belarus Democracy Act of 2004. This was a um, United States federal law signed by President George W. Bush in 2004, and it authorized uh, assistance for Belarusian NGOs, independent mass media, and political parties that were advancing democracy in Belarus. So in November 2020, this act of 2004 was reauthorized, and now it's called Belarus Democracy, Human Rights, and Sovereignty Act of 2020. And also in February of this year already, a resolution was submitted to the Committee of Foreign Affairs uh, that supported uh, the fight of the Belarusian people uh, and their democratic aspirations and condemned the election rigging and violent crackdown and peaceful protesters. And also in this resolution, uh, Lukashenko's regime was referred to as illegitimate. Um, the European Union and the United States did not recognize the outcome of the Belarusian election. Uh, the EU countries, uh, the United Kingdom, Canada, and the USA did not recognize Lukashenko as a legitimate president. They introduced sanctions, visa bans, and froze uh, assets of Lukashenko and many top Belarusian officials. But more important than sanctions or visa bans on freezing assets was um, the rise of civil society in Belarus. Uh, it does not mean that civil society did not exist in Belarus before, uh, before the summer and fall of 2020. Formal opposition first appeared in Belarus in the 1980s. But what Belarus witnessed right before and after the presidential election of 2020 was the gradual emergence of a new type of civil society that was connected uh, by means of social media. And this new civil society was gradually turning into an arena in which notions such as democracy, freedom, elections stopped being empty shells as they used to be before for many people. Uh, and it, it seems like citizens of Belarus are finally learning how to internalize the substance of these uh, concepts. However, some commentators warned that the demands for such abstract notions as freedom and dignity, they are not enough and they should be accompanied by more concrete political and economic demands to sustain the protests and strikes and to achieve the ultimate goal of removing Lukashenko from power. Belarusian civil society has other weaknesses too, such as like the lack of skills to convert pol their political demands into action. Uh, Belarusian uh, representatives of the opposition have been absent from regional and state political bodies for a quarter of a century. There is no proper leadership and activists, they lack formal power and uh, organizational knowledge. And this is just a few of the weaknesses of Belarusian civil society. Now, the major question is, will Lukashenko fall? Uh, there are some factors that say that uh, he might stay in power for a while still. Uh, first of all, uh, regimes like Lukashenko's, personalized authoritarian regimes, they do not give up without a fight. Uh, also, Belarusian law enforcement agencies are very loyal to Lukashenko and they are his disciplined elite. The political elite is not, uh, uh, it still remains unified in Belarus as well. And also public officials, state, uh, um, their supporters within society and members of security services so far, they have not abandoned Lukashenko. They're still supporting him. The protests have largely died out uh, due to repressions, fatigue, and very cold weather. Temperatures in Minsk and uh, in Belarus dropped below zero, 20 degrees below zero centigrade recently. So it's very cold to protest outside. Um, also, um, a current um, a uh, public opinion poll conducted by the Center for East European and International Studies showed that 20% of Belarusians did not believe that protests could do anything and could change anything. But what is worse, 33% of people in Belarus did not know what type of government was uh, preferable for Belarus. Not only they didn't think that uh, democracy was the best form of government, but they just didn't know what else could be there. Uh, so um, researchers who conducted that uh, uh, opinion poll believe that there is no clear trajectory for political change in Belarus right now. So is everything re really so gloomy in Belarus right now? Well, what many people hoped for, namely that Lukashenko's, uh, they were hoping for Lukashenko's complete fall, it did not happen yet, but it doesn't mean that it will not happen. 
Lukashenko is quite embattled after the last six months, and also he desperately needs money. And suppressing protests and other types of disobedience requires a lot of resources. So the fail safe financial support of numerous law enforcement groups in Belarus may gradually become a problem due to the deepening economic crisis and Lukashenko's potential inability to secure subsidies and loans after the European Parliament did not recognize him as a legitimate president and announced him a persona non grata in uh, the European Union. As of now, Lukashenko can only rely on Russia for financial assistance. But even in Russia, the establishment has already started to under, uh, realize that he has no legitimacy in Belarusian society and cannot be trusted. And that is why I believe that Lukashenko will step down sooner or later. The question is how soon and to what extent? Will he leave politics and the country completely? Or will he secure some other position for himself and become some sort of a great cardinal who will watch over his successor, whoever that person might be? And now let me show just some images of protests in Belarus. So this is what was happening in uh, fall. And Belarus has never seen anything like that before. Um, this is the very nice picture. Look at the right police and how well they're equipped. Uh, and this is all, of course, comes from the taxpayers' money. So this um, sign here says that your 80% are drawn with blood. Um, this is a very famous picture by now, this guy. Uh, Luckily, he wasn't killed, he was just unconscious, but this is uh, one of the members of the riot police. This is a picture from one of the police stations. So they, they had no rooms like uh, to put people in cells, so they put them in a, in a gym. So this is a gym and these people were kept there for hours like this and you see the flag here, they're all covered in blood. Um, this is what they have been doing in Minsk for half a year already. And again, the equipment of the riot police is just amazing. I have never seen anything like that before. Um, this is again, this is, I believe it's in Minsk and the main avenue and Independence Avenue. And um, this is a very famous lady. She's like 80 years old and she protests constantly. Uh, this was the day of Lukashenko's birthday and people brought, so to say, gifts to, for him. And this is Lukashenko with a gun. Um, thinking about if, if he believes that 80% really voted for him, why would he need a gun against his own people, against some riot police? Uh, this uh, women, uh, one of the women marches that were also happening. And one more picture showing people protesting against. Uh, these are all people who are unarmed, and this is the riot police here. Thank you for your attention. And I'm done. All right, thank you so much uh, for three very interesting presentations. So we'll all come back, uh, all the panelists, and we'll turn to some of the questions that have been coming in. In the meanwhile, anybody who's been listening, I see um, you know, you are very welcome to just add your questions in the Q&A or the chat for that matter. We'll find them either way, but this way we can, we can go through the questions because we have some time to do that. So I'm just going to, at the moment, um, Gosh, let's take uh, Jesse Driscoll's question about Poland. Um, David, I wonder if what we are seeing in Poland is more general. In your view, how much is the abortion rights issue an encoded pro-nationalist anti-EU vote or present, uh, protest? In Georgia and Hungary in particular, conservative social values are used to prime voters with populist messages that are explicitly anti-LGBTQ. Uh, the EU says, we'll make you accept gay marriage. And it works crudely. How is Poland distinct? So we'll start with that question for you, please. Okay, thanks. Yeah, good question. I actually think Poland is distinct here. Look, unlike, um, unlike uh, uh, Georgia, uh, Poland is in the EU. Of course, Hungary is in the EU as well. But the EU is actually very popular in Poland. Uh, it's been, it's been an, a, an enormous boon for farmers who've gotten paid for having their land, sometimes paid for not growing crops, as has happened. The subsidy, so the, 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 the farm land has uh, increased both in value and uh, uh, peasants have benefited a lot. 
before Poland was in the EU, same in Hungary, both these countries joined in 2004, and you did have a strong or a stronger anti-EU sentiment. But since the EU has been so beneficial economically, right, there's, there's no one there who wants to say anything against the EU. They, they say, we want to stay there, but we don't want to follow your rules. So in that sense, you're right that they talk about the EU forcing us to accept gay marriage. Yes, as you write, uh, and that the EU is too much in favor of gay rights and rights to abortion, and we're very different. But I do think, really, it, it you know it doesn't make sense outside of that broader campaign. I mean, I talked about it in terms of a broader you know, cultural counter-revolution. One could also see it a little, you know, ratchet down a little more, uh, uh, ratchet down a bit, and say that uh, unlike in Hungary, where the Catholic Church is not so strong, right there, the Catholic Church is a, a powerful in Poland, right, a powerful institutional player in in towns all over Poland. During the communist times, the state had built up factories and built up local museums and sports clubs and all these kind of local activities there. But after 1989, all that fell apart and the church is the institution that survives there. So the government has made a big deal, right? Uh, uh, compact with the church to give it more control of education, uh, to, to have it play a greater role in culture as a whole. Uh, they've funded, directly funded from the state budget some Catholic universities and take their graduates straight into the state administration and don't take as many graduates from uh, the state universities, official state university. So yeah, I think it is more a, a general part of both this broader cultural counter-revolution and this pact in Poland where we're going to be able, we're gonna push through our authoritarianism together, together with the church. Thank you. So a second question from Jesse Driscoll on Russia. So Professor Smith, it says, I'm interested in hearing whatever you want to share about the smart vote system. There's a loyal security force and a fairly cohesive set of pro-Putin elites. Do you think Navalny's smart vote push is likely to be viable in September 2021? Duma election is putting a blocking coalition in the Duma. Um, thank you. So. The first thing I want to say about smart vote is that it has a mixed reception in Russia and among the old school opposition. So essentially what smart vote is, is strategic voting. You vote for a person maybe who you don't entirely agree with, but who you think you agree enough with who can win, right? And for many of the old opposition, the democratic opposition in Russia, this is anathema. Like this is a sort of anathema idea that you're not just, that you would support a communist candidate or a spravitly Russia candidate uh, just because he's not United Russia. So it's controversial. Um, in order to keep United Russia in power uh, as national support for the party waned, Russia instituted a mixed electoral system. Again, this is the Yeltsin system. So they brought the Yeltsin system back. And the idea is that you have half single member districts, plurality districts and the party. And United Russia can only really get about 30% of the votes in the party list race now. So the regime is bringing back old Yeltsin tactics, like creating parties that are stocking horses uh, that look like new and different kinds of parties with very democratic names, but really are run out of the Kremlin and will provide a loyal opposition. There was, um, they're also uh, doing things like letting United Russia candidates run without party affiliation. And then they appear to be independent candidates and people may support them 
because they have good ties to Moscow or may not realize, although in many cases, voters are very clear on who was or has been a United Russia candidate and who isn't. Sometimes it's not at all subtle, right? People just resign from the party and run as independents when they were in the party months ago. So in this context, smart voting is who are the real independents who can manage to sneak onto the ballot here? Or who are the who are the party leaders, for example, a communist party leader in Moscow who might work for housing reform or <clears throat> pension reform? <coughs> and so what it does is force the regime to be more and more clever and press the regime. <coughs> Excuse me. And what it also does is give uh, opposition voters a way to say anybody but United Russia and to recognize that they're not voting for the party and to turn the election into a huge resource as I think happened in Belarus where everybody knew that the, the candidate who wins didn't actually win. And that transforms the election from a contest over seats to a contest over hearts and minds. And I think that's a really big advantage to smart vote. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a question for Dr. Brell, please, um, from Ernesto Fraga. Why are so many women protesting in Belarus? Has this happened before in previous protests? Um. No, it hasn't happened before in previous protests. Previous protests were quite small, but for the one in, what was it, 2010, when there were about 40,000 people outside. I don't know for sure why there are so many people, but I my assumption is because Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, who ran for presidency instead of her husband, who was arrested and put to prison even before, uh, the presidential election. So he couldn't even um, register as a candidate. And uh, sometimes I think why Lukashenko even allowed her to register, I think they did not uh, believe that a housewife with two little kids would be able to actually do anything. And all of a sudden Tikhanovska started, uh, um, uh, when she had pre-election rallies, uh, there were so many thousands of people were coming to support her and this was something unheard of. But still Lukashenko, even at that point, they didn't believe that she could be a real threat. And it turned out that she was because uh, by um, non-official data, uh, up to 97% voted for her and only three for Lukashenko and he would never ever um, you know, forgive this. As it is known, uh, the next day after the election, Tikhanovska was held in KGB in the KGB for about seven hours. And then she was literally, she was made to record a video in which she was just saying, people don't go outside and don't protest. And she looked as a completely broken woman and then they called, uh, kicked her out of the country. And the rumor is that they basically told her that they would kill her children if she would not, you know, record that uh, video. So this is how uh, the regime works. And I think, you know, her courage and that she still, you know, ran for presidency instead of her husband who was arrested. I think it just uh, gave this kind of um, incentive to many women in Belarus and women, when they were protesting, they would just, you know, dress in white clothes and just go outside as if they were not protesting. So hoping that the right police in this case, they would not be arrested by them. Uh, but, oh, they would go for a walk, so to say, with an umbrella, which had right, uh, uh, red and, and white colors, the colors of the flag that their position is using right now. Um, and this was their way to, to support uh, the protest and to support the men who were arrested and beaten and, and tortured. But women were arrested too and then tortured uh, almost as much as men. So I, I think uh, Tsikhanovska in many uh, ways, like her example, um, gave those women, you know, the incentive to go and protest. Thank you so much. Um, a further question for you and then for Professor Smith is whether you could elaborate uh, more on how the authoritarian regime in Belarus, you know, has changed or adapted to the protests or in the case uh, how 
the regime in Russia has adapted to protests generally or the Navalny protests. So how, what's changed, let's start with Belarus in terms of how the regime has um, adapted or altered its ways. I don't think that the Belarusian regime has adapted in any case because Lukashenko now faces a dilemma. If he adapts somehow, so if he lets go of the repressions that he imposes on people, then people who, whose discontent is still boiling, even maybe not so openly as before, but there are so many people right now who are against him because uh, uh, the, the latest data says that about 33,000 people have been arrested in Belarus since uh, August. So, which means right now in Belarus, in every family, everyone at least knows of someone who was arrested, who suffered from the regime uh, for the last six months. And people are very angry. And there is the slogan that we will not for forget and we will not forgive. Uh, and people will not forgive. Uh, uh, so uh, if Lukashenko um, stops the repressions, then he um, there is a threat to his personal power. And what is he going to do with the people if, if they feel that, okay, right now we can go back to the streets and continue protesting. On the other hand, if he keeps suppressing every, everybody, you know, um, then it's just a bad signal to uh, the community outside Belarus. Uh, the EU is already not going to help him in any way. And in Russia, although Russia is not going to interfere in like with the military force, which was uh, the fear of many people in August, let's say, and in September, Russia is not going to do that. But Russia is not going to help uh, the people of Belarus to topple their dictator either. They're just watching and waiting and uh, to see what is going to happen. And But on the other hand, Russia wants Lukashenko to deal with this crisis. And Russia wants Lukashenko to find a way for power transition. So um, I think it will take time, some more time probably for Lukashenko to realize that he actually needs to somehow adapt and find a way to deal with this. But it's difficult for him because he doesn't want to lose his personal power. He's been in power for 26 years. He doesn't want to go anywhere. He wants to stay. And it's very difficult for him to find a way to not lose his power and to leave and somehow to stay. So I don't think our regime is in any way adapting to the situation. Thank you. Uh, Professor Smith. So in contrast, I think there has been a, a big shift in Russian response, especially recently. So Russia started to build an enormous uh, coercive infrastructure and a legal infrastructure to use politicized justice after the 2011-12 large scale protests. But I think Russia prefers, as, a, as most autocrats do, to use that in a targeted selective way as opposed to in a public and, and sort of mass way to induce self-censorship as instead of having to use course and force directly. And it was common when I was doing this research and, and also, um, first of all, in 2011-12, there was very little police violence until points of provocation that were used to then shut down the protests. Um, and the police were very disciplined. They're very well trained. They know European tactics. Uh, you can often see them targeting. They use this uh, tactic of having spotters high up, looking for instigators in the crowd, targeting specific people. So one thing that changed in the last Navalny protest was always before this point, um, protesters themselves would part and let them go after the, per the instigator. This time they were not parting. They were fighting back. They were pulling back. Uh, you may have seen some of this video of pelting uh, riot police with snowballs and so forth. So the crowd got more aggressive as the police got more aggressive. And um, certainly not as aggressive as they might have been, but more aggressive. And so uh, often you would hear during this period between 2011 and now, well, at least we're not Belarus. And this was a, a sort of, the, this regime is bad, but it's not as bad as Lukashenko. It doesn't use violence and coercive force in the same way. By revealing itself as ready to use that coercive force, it has lost some legitimacy. And it's very hard to know what that is. Polls are different. 
polls, it's hard to capture that. But um, that's why it's been quite risky and the regime risks backfire by becoming more coercive. And let me just end on this point that people may not know. It has now, uh, it, Russia has now extended its foreign agent restrictions to scholars. So now uh, the regime is inducing self-censorship among scholars. And you can be, uh, you now, if you take money from foreign entities, have to report as a scholar, a uh, foreign agent. That means that you need to um, go through rigorous reporting mechanisms. It's very time consuming. It's difficult to comply with. And what it means is that it's creating mechanisms of self-censorship and non-collaboration within the scholarly community. So this is a very far reaching, extensive, uh, intrusive network that's emerging of laws and structures. Thank you. Um, that does not bode well for organizing events like this with having people from Russia itself uh, mm -hmm. zoom in and contribute their perspective. Um, you know, this is a, a panel that has been so interesting, so fascinating. And one of the co-sponsors is the European Union Center of Southern California. So that motivates a question I have for Professor Ost, which is thinking about what is the role of the EU in responding to these protests and to the reproductive rights of women in Poland? Is there a role? Is there um, any efficacy that we could expect from the EU uh, given how limited their abilities have been to respond to violations of European norms and the rule of law and restrictions on the judiciary. Can we expect the EU at some point to uh, be involved or weigh in on these kinds of reproductive rights of any sort in Poland? Well, as we know, the, EU, the EU's position, and it's shown, shown this in Hungary and in Poland as well, is that as long as you are following your laws, then we have nothing to say about it. So on this issue, there's nothing in the uh, EU communautaire that requires a certain position to be taken on reproductive rights. Poland has even, uh, they have criticized and may well formally withdraw from the Istanbul Convention Against Domestic Violence. That may not be its proper name, but, but the, a, a big convention there in Poland, the political leaders have said, we're going to leave it, we don't like it. Not, of course, because they say we want domestic violence, but because the document itself talks about disparities according to gender. It uses that term. And so they say this is an infiltration here. Uh, in terms of the constitutional issues, this is where the European Union has taken a greater role so far. The so-called uh, Venice Commission, if I, I hope I'm not mistaken, I think that's the name of the, the formal organization that looks at uh, situations in the judiciary and has criticized and has gotten short-term retreats from, from, the, uh, from, uh, from the Polish government. But this has been a problem that we've seen in Hungary and we see it in Poland that the EU set up very strong conditions for joining the European Union, but very weak conditions for any kind of negative sanctions. One thing Europe could do, of course, and I, so far, the European Union hasn't done it. Some individual organizations are doing it on this particular issue of abortion rights. Some uh, NGOs have said, well, we'll create a fund and fly women and their partners in to uh, uh, get a safe and legal abortion. Uh, so uh, there can be expansion on that issue. Otherwise, it's, uh, it, it definitely is this big problem in, in the EU that you have to follow the law itself. I'll mention one, uh, yeah. Okay, well, I, actually, I'll leave it at there. Thanks. Thank you. We have a, a question here that's for all three of you. 
uh, from Aaron Scherer. It is, for each of these countries, is there a notable role that any state actors have taken in supporting protesters? Supporting something like strikes or mass resignation, maybe. So maybe we can start with uh, Dr. Brell um, and then uh, Dr. Smith and Dr. Oath. Um, as for Belarus, I would not say that uh, state, um, body state institutions uh, showed any mass support. Of course, there are the way people, like let's say uh, diplomat, Belarusian diplomats that were um, ambassadors in some foreign countries, or some people within law enforcement agencies who resigned and who openly said, we, we don't want to be part of this. Uh, there were, of course, people uh, in state-owned enterprises who went on strikes, but those strikes um, did not turn into something mass, so that, you know, the whole, or the majority of people at the enterprise would stop working. Um, within his uh, quarter century in power, Lukashenko has built a system where um, all um, people who are part of uh, who are state employees, they depend completely on the state and on his benevolence. And in Belarus, there are no political parties, no clans, no groups that can, you know, fight with each other or against Lukashenko and somehow consolidate against him. So he created a system where there is no way uh, some kind of dissent can appear. And all the, uh, since all these people understand that uh, their well-being depends on whether they ho keep holding their positions, they, on mass scale, they do not um, protest him uh, against him, and they did not abandon him so far. And even, you know, on on, on the level of ordinary people, uh, even among my friends there, when I ask them, okay, why why don't you participate? And I would hear something, okay, I work for an enterprise where 51% uh, belongs to the state. And we were uh, directly told, if you participate in the protest, you're going to lose your job. And losing a job in Belarus right now is uh, a huge problem because you will not find anything. Uh, people on average in Belarus make about like maybe $400 a month, not a, per week, per month or maybe less, and that's average, which means there are many people who are not making even this much. So to lose a job under such conditions is uh, um, a big problem. And many people, there is this huge silent majority that uh, is not going to participate, uh, especially if they are state employees, especially if they're, let's say, teachers or uh, doctors who get paid from the government. Thank you. Smith. So the picture in Russia looks similar. Um, one of the roles of smart vote is to change the opportunity structure within local and regional government uh, offices, legislatures, and find some support for uh, these non-political issue-based protests. And that has happened in some places. So we have, for example, around Moscow housing and contestation of the massive reconstruction program, the parties uh, like LDPR and KPRF jumped in on the side of tenants to demand their rights or homeowners to demand their rights. In the Far East, we saw regional deputies joining the protests in support of Fergal, Governor Fergal. Um, so there, and then in the other regions, we see issue based. But again, the regime has a lot of levers of power. So they controlled the trade unions, for example. So while there was some trade union support for strikes uh, against pension reform, uh, a chapter by Irina Olympieva in a book that I've been working on with colleagues about urban activism shows that the regime really clamp down on trade unions capacity to support that kind of protest. And cross class coalition is the holy grail here, right? To get to get uh, sort of labor together with the middle class uh, protesting is what would bring about some significant change. Um, in, that, in the trash protest I talked about uh, in my presentation, 
you see the use of uh, not only threats of losing your job, but actually more than just a person here or there losing their jobs for having taken part in the encampment in the North or in protests around the city. So the opportunity structure is still very closed, but it is opening. And one thing we haven't talked about, which I'll just mention very briefly, is that there is behind the scenes economic support from uh, economic actors for these organizations. And of course, probably the state knows where it's coming from. It comes all through electronic transfer and crowdsource fundraising, but there is quite a bit of autonomous economic actor support, which may be why the regime has been so happy to let uh, entrepreneurs wither and die in the face of COVID um, and to shrink the private sector at the expense of the state sector. Thank you. So, so if I can uh, make a few comments in response. Yeah, well, look, uh, as for this immediate cause of the demonstrations, the government does have, and it tells the excuse that, well, we didn't do it. It was an independent Supreme Court. Now, most people understand that the court is not independent, but nevertheless, uh, that's been a way to um, minimize some of the protests. So what you've had is not any, any kind of severe protest against that. Some in the right-wing coalition have said, well, we need to change the law a bit, maybe do a little something, but, uh, but it's been pretty much behind this, this issue. The only place where there has been some kind of uh, uh, criticism and uh, uh, movement from, um, from within the governing coalition is that just recently in a proposal now in Poland to do just what the government did in Hungary with the press, that is to have state-owned companies or close associates of the party, private individuals, buy up the press, buy up the opposition press, first weaken it by not place ads in there by any state institution, then buy it up on the market, and then disband it or change its, uh, change its uh, political line. They've been doing that recently. They proposed a new tax about that. And here's where some in the right-wing coalition because you have a couple of parties there and they can easily see, well, if we are on the outside uh, for any moment, then, uh, then, then we're going to get caught in that too. So that's been the only opposition. Otherwise, you know, less so than in Russia or in Belarus, but still the state is a key distributor of goods, right? There's not a lot of uh, great access and huge opportunities by leaving that to, uh, to, to, to another sphere, much less so than even you know, some state officials, of course, with uh, uh, Trump did leave and could find some kind of support in the opposition to Trump uh, and, and, and save themselves, save their positions, right? And still be in a good political place uh, but uh, yeah, that that those options have not been have not been available, so there hasn't been much defection. All right, thank you so much. This has been such an intellectual treat for me. For certain, I've learned so much from the three of you. It's been very stimulating. I also uh, want to take this opportunity not only to thank our wonderful panelists for their insights and their thoughts uh, of these protests. But I'd like to thank my co-organizers at Scripps College, uh, Agnieszka Batsorczyk and Corey Titsara. And thank you for supporting this event along with the Keck Center for International and Strategic Studies at Claremont McKenna College. So we're gonna close here. My name is Hilary Apple. I just wanna thank you so much on behalf of the Keck Center for uh, being part of this panel in Claremont, California. And uh, I appreciate it and I wish you all well. <laughs>